Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us for our webinar this morning, um, which is looking at how energy and industry precincts can drive economic growth and support decarbonisation. My name is Rebecca Burden, and I'm the Managing Director at the Energy Transition Hub. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting. In my case, the Wurundjeri people, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, the webinar this morning is being hosted by the Climate and Energy College and the Energy Transition Hub. It's the final in a series on industrial demand response that has been sponsored by the Victorian Clean Technology Fund. Um, and we um, would very much like to thank our sponsors. It's been fantastic being able to put on the seminar series. It seems very timely. Um, the webinar is being recorded and the video will be available on the College and Hub website later today. Um, I would also invite participants to submit questions at any time during Clark's presentation and we'll get to as many as possible in the Q&A session after the presentation. Uh, to submit a question and also to upvote your questions, please use the Q&A feature, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'd also invite you to use the chat feature, um, but please don't post Q&A questions there because we will focus on those that come through the Q&A channel. But um, we very much encourage an active conversation as the presentation um, unfolds. Um, so for now, please let me introduce Clark Butler. Clark is um, an IEF, IEEFA contributor and a corporate advisor with a background in the technology and finance sectors. In addition to being a director of an investor in technology and data companies, he's also actively exploring technology and financing solutions to encourage investment in renewable energy solutions. Clark has written reports for the IEFA on the US and Australia's renewable power purchase agreements, the transition of Shell and, the to um, and total to renewable energy, and decarbonising aluminium and other heavy industry in the Hunter region and Gladstone. Um, and we're delighted to have Clark speaking today. Uh, over to you, Clark. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca, and good morning. Um, thanks for spending your morning with me talking about decarbonisation. Um, I, I, as Rebecca mentioned, I, I have a background in corporate finance. I got into this area with a, a principal interest of, of working out how to bring long-term capital into the renewable energy sector. And that's really where demand management um, attracted my attention. The idea of pulling together the demand load of heavy industry, the largest users of electricity, um, is a really interesting way to create the right investment environment for um, renewable energy. So today I'm going to run through a few slides with you. Just share my screen now. And, and then I'm very happy to have a conversation after that. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, heavy industry precincts in general, um, but with a particular focus on, on the Hunter Valley, um, which is an area that I spent a lot of time working on in the last few months. Uh, the, it's a great time to be talking about transformation um, in, these, in these energy areas. Um, first, that COVID has really focused government and, and in fact everyone on investment in growth, uh, on stimulus and, and on, on the possibility of change. Um, secondly, the, from a strategic perspective, the supply chain security has become a, a key government theme um, and the, uh, securing the supply chain of, of important metals um, for, the, uh, for, for key uh, Australian industries is, uh, is key within that. And then thirdly, and perhaps where my interest really lies, is that there are foundational industries in these industry precincts that are really at a crossroads at the moment. They, they could fail or they could prosper depending on what happens in the next few years. Aluminium is key to that, but also ammonia, steel, and a range of others that I'll talk about at the end. And the main problem is energy cost. Uh, it, it is the differentiator that makes a country internationally competitive or not in, in these types of industries. Uh, my argument and it is a, a shameless uh, adoption of, of Ross Garneau's book, Superpower, that renewable energy can be a key enabler for growth. And, and as I'll discuss this morning, I think it's time that renewable energy is now um, a cost driver 
for advantage in Australia as well. Looking at aluminium in specifically for a moment, as you'll see on the slide, if you, and apologies for the, for the small size of the chart, but just look at the trend. Um, aluminium hasn't been a great place to invest over the last decade. The price has been up and down um, like a yo-yo. Uh, a lot of this has been driven by a significant growth in Chinese production over 10 years to the point where China now produces and consumes more than 50% of the global aluminium market. Um, there is an interesting change afoot, however. The long-term outlook for aluminium is strong for a number of reasons. Um, and, and in fact, 4% per annum growth is projected. The, the first is that in the key industries, um, transportation, which consumes about 30% uh, of global aluminium, um, construction, which is the next largest, and then uh, electronics and, uh, and consumer packaged goods, that there are some significant trends towards A, increased use of aluminium, and B, a focus on embedded emissions and a preference for low carbon aluminium. Um, the, uh, the, the London Metals Exchange has recognised that and will, be, will introduce a low carbon aluminium price from next year, which will mean that there will be two markets in aluminium from then on. One that, that may continue to, to suffer the the ups and downs in, in supply and demand swings, um, and, and one that will be a, a low carbon price. And at the moment, the forecast is that there will be a, um, a significant uh, gap between supply and demand, um, favouring demand in, in that market, which means that the, the pricing should be more less volatile and, and stronger. Um, another key driver is embedded emissions and the focus on, on uh, climate-related financial disclosures. The RE100, for example, a, a very successful group of, of global companies that have started looking at um, energy consumption, uh, direct emissions, and also supply chain emissions. Um, examples of that are BMW um, is looking to buy only low carbon aluminium. Um, BMW can uses more aluminium in a year than, than the largest smelters in, in Australia produce. Uh, and Nescafe in, in Nespresso and Apple have also announced that they're going to uh, only buy low carbon aluminium in the future. The reason that aluminium is, uh, is so challenging in Australia is that it is largely, it's called electric, uh, it's called solid electricity. Um, and that's because roughly a third of the cost of making aluminium comes from electricity. In Australia, we have um, privileged access to Illumina, where the world's largest producer of bauxite and one of the largest refiners of alumina. Um, we have high quality um, people and plants. It really is electricity cost that is, uh, that is what's holding us back. And it is holding us back. All the smelters um, have said in the press that they are losing money. Um, and there's a very good chance that, that Rio and Alcoa will pull out of the market over the next few years if things don't change. Rio has already announced that it's closing the New Zealand plant um, uh, and, and, and that comes straight down to electricity cost. So the question that we asked at IEFA is, can we deliver renewable energy at a price that makes aluminium internationally competitive? And we think the answer to that is yes. Roughly speaking, internationally competitive electricity for large electricity users is around 40 to 50 Australian dollars per megawatt hour. And it needs to be firmed or at least semi-firmed. And, and that's because uh, smelters, whilst they are a large interruptible load, they can exercise significant demand side management um, that they cannot be down for very long at all. And particularly in Australia, Smelters have about three hours of thermal reserve. If they're down for longer than that, then the pots can freeze and it can take a long time to bring them back again. Um, Portland in Melbourne, in, in Victoria was a good example of that. It took more than nine months to get back to normal production a couple of years ago. Um, so can we get there? Yes, we, we say we absolutely can get there. If you, if you look at the trend lines of the wind and solar on the slide, um, they've been driving down significantly in uh, to the point that Lazard says that that 
wind is the cheapest source of electricity in the US now and, and followed closely by solar. It's a huge project to replace the existing um, supply of electricity to the major smelters in Australia with renewable energy. We're talking four, five to six billion dollars of investment per smelter. Um, that's important, and I'm concentrating on Portland in Victoria, uh, Tomago in, in the Hunter Valley, New South Wales, and uh, Boyne smelters in Gladstone in Queensland. This is where it gets interesting. It's not just the, the smelter's problem to solve. The, the reason I focus on the smelter is that it's the largest single demand load and it can drive um, the, the, the price and, and, the, and the technology decisions. It's also an incredibly valuable asset um, for, the, for grid stability to provide both foundational demand and, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to provide demand side response. Um, but it takes the, the whole region um, and, and, a, and, a, and a broad number of players to, to come up with the solution. You've got the um, renewable energy supply and, and uh, generation on one side, uh, the land owners, um, renewable energy developers and their long-term owners. You've got the, um, the, the smelter in the middle and it, it actually requires some investment in technology to improve demand side response. The problem at the moment is there's no explicit price signal to create a, um, a motivation for that investment. There's a technology known as Energy uh, by Energy Potty or a New Zealand company that provides some very interesting heat exchange um, technology that, that gives a, um, a smelter the ability to modulate for almost an indefinite period, but at least if it can modulate for more than eight hours, then it can time shift and, and, and provide a, a valuable arbitrage ability um, to play in the, in the electricity market, both for the owner of the smelter and also for AEMO to ensure grid stability. And then in each of the areas where there's a smelter, um, there are a lot of other heavy industry users. So I, on the slide here, you have the, the Hunter Valley major energy users, two steel producers, Molly Cop and Infrabuild, um, the Port of Newcastle uh, and, uh, and Orica, which is the largest, uh, also an electricity user, but importantly for this, the largest user of gas in New South Wales. The solution that, that we have identified is a combination of renewable energy, demand side response, and the use of surplus um, uh, electricity for, for other purposes to create other forms of, of energy. So let me go through those uh, in, in a um, one by one. Tomago, and, and the same goes for, for Portland and Boyne, uses around a gigawatt of, um, of electricity uh, capacity. That in order to provide um, that at a sufficient level of reliability, we may need between 2.5 and 3 gigawatts of renewable energy. And that will be in a form of a mixture of, of wind and solar to create as much um, uh, supply balance as, as, the, as the demand requires. If you add the uh, Tomago um, demand side response as a virtual battery, so the ability to put up to 250 megawatts of capacity back into the grid um, by by turning down the electricity supply, um, you, you can get a, a great deal more efficiency out of the, the, um, the renewable energy load. For vast amounts of the time, because of the, the significant overbuild, if you like, there will be a great deal of surplus electricity. And that's really valuable to um, a large industry precinct like the Hunter Valley um, for making hydrogen. Um, the, the, the main, Hydrogen is um, a, a fantastic prospect um, for the future, but a lot of, um, of experts will tell you, like Bloomberg, for example, that it won't be economically viable until 2030 at least, although that number does, that date does keep coming back. There are two main reasons for that. One is that the, the cost, the, the significant cost in producing hydrogen is producing it for export, the liquefaction 
um, compression, transportation and storage costs. Uh, and secondly, um, electrolysis requires a huge amount of electricity. Our approach to the, the, the hunter, um, and, and the same goes for Gladstone, is focused on domestic use. Um, as I said, Orica is the largest use of gas, user of gas in New South Wales. But it uses natural gas to convert it to hydrogen, to make ammonium, to make ammonium nitrate. If we can provide green hydrogen into that process at, at um, you know, roughly the cost or, or better, than, um, than, it, than it takes at the moment to convert uh, gas through the, the steam methane reforming process, then not only will it help Orica reduce emissions, um, but it, it will provide the foundation for a hydrogen industry. And over time, hydrogen will get cheaper as the input costs come down, uh, whereas gas is always gonna have a fuel cost and, and driven by the international commodity price or more so by the Australian um, availability. So the, the two costs for hydrogen electrolysis are electricity and the capital cost of the, of the electrolyzer itself. The capital cost, like um, the cost for um, renewable energy gener generation, will drop drastically over the next 10 years as um, hydrogen production expands and countries like um, India and China start building huge electrolyzers. The electricity cost in the Hunter can be extremely low from the start if it's run intermittently uh, using the renewable energy that is effectively surplus to the, to the, the core base load the, um, from Tomago. And, and, and that provides the balance um, and, and the reason for thinking about this as a precinct. Um, if you take what, what the Hunter and, and these other precincts have uh, pl plentiful land uh, a lot of industrial land that is really, um, frankly, not useful for anything other than heavy industry, um, but can be ideal for um, for uh, solar and wind installations or for other new heavy industry. Um, a skilled workforce, uh, and in the case of, of Newcastle, a strong research university with a with a, a, a pedigree in um, in hydrogen and and industrial process engineering. Um, a a world-class deep water port um, that is looking for a transition from coal exports to, um, to new exports uh, and, and an existing precinct of, of strong um, manufacturers and heavy industry. The, the combined economics makes it a very attractive um, proposition to invest um, renewable energy into that precinct. The, the question then becomes, how do you make that happen? And it, there, there's been a lot of talk with technology investment roadmaps and the like about the government's role in, in, uh, in energy policy. I'm focused on private investment and how to attract private investment to the, um, into the market. And I think what it takes to make it happen is first common interest, um, in doing this report for the Hunter Valley and then a subsequent report last month for Gladstone. Um, at IEFA, we've discovered that there's a huge amount of common interest across the, the whole community from, from businesses who are very much engaged in working out how to, to play a role from state government that is definitely looking for a solution through to um, community leaders. Um, the, the Hunter is a great example. It's already been through transition. It was 21 years ago, uh, it might have even been today, that um, the BHP closed its uh, steel production in Newcastle. And they've learned from that, um, that very difficult uh, transition that they need to be ahead of the game. They know that, that diversification is gonna have to happen in the Hunter Valley in order to, for it to be successful. And they're very much behind heavy industry um, reinvestment and, and the energy sources that that need um, to be uh, to be implemented to take advantage of that. Um, second, there's commitment. We have some commitment from the state government, um, and, and both New South Wales and Queensland governments have indicated um, uh, interest in, in in making this happen. It takes coordination, um, and and that's a combination of bringing industry together, but there is a government role in that. It takes a clear investment case 
Um, our argument is that if we bring the demand load to bear, the investors will sign up um, to invest in the sort of large scale renewable energy we're talking about. Uh, apologies, my slides disappeared. Um, the, it takes a couple of things to really attract the right sort of capital. One is scale. The, the, there's a reason that industry super hasn't been attracted to um, in, in any major way to renewable energy over the last few years. That, that they, when you're a hundred billion dollar fund or thereabouts, you have to write significant checks, uh, equity investments into projects. You can't afford to, to participate in, in hundred, two hundred million dollar projects. There's really only been one large scale opportunity in the last five years, and that was the, the Powering Australia's Renewable Future Fund that, that AGL set up with and, and, and partnered with QIC. Um, but with a, with a precinct solution at this scale, it would be very attractive to large scale industries, uh, industry super and other long term investors. The second thing you need to attract them is term. Infrastructure investors are looking for 20, 25 years of, of investment horizon. Um, the average power purchase agreement these days is, is seven years and falling. Um, so there's a mismatch but, uh, and, and that's, that's a place where the state government can step in and provide a certain amount of underwriting over that long term, uh, knowing that, uh, that that industry, if it gets the right, energy price will certainly stay and, and continue to invest in the precinct, but, um, but providing that, that level of surety for investors. And the third aspect of um, what, what's needed to attract investment is um, investment certainty. Um, the risk profile of investing in, in renewable assets in Australia has been problematic over the, over the last few years with more than a dozen major policy changes in as many years. Um, I'm not an advocate for significant policy change. I'd actually just like it to be, uh, to, to sit still and allow investors to um, set their, their risk profiles around it. Um, and our argument is that if you think about the investment opportunity at, at this scale and with the, the collaboration of the major demand um, loads, you you can address uh, that risk issue uh, and, and attract low cost capital. And low cost capital is actually all that is required to generate um, sustainable and internationally competitive electricity prices. And then the final thing, the government facilitation, it, it does require the government to, 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 to pull together. Uh, on the demand side response um, concept, uh, the smelters are not currently motivated to invest in, uh, in in modulation technology because there's not a clear price signal. AEMO is bringing out a demand side response price um, soon, and that that will help. But if you look at the energy markets in Europe, there are more opportunities for large scale scale users to um, to make significant revenue by providing flexible. Um, uh, manufacturing and, and providing en electricity back into the market at certain times. The, with a, a, a commitment to addressing that issue, um, I think we can create the incentive for private investment in modulation technology, uh, which will make the smelters uh, incredibly valuable assets uh, in, in the grid um, and, and also sustain their, um, the profitability of their businesses for, for a long period of time. So the key here is not the government investing in a particular technological solution, but actually investing in the precinct itself, uh, in coordinating the, the, the users and bringing them together um, to, to attract private investment about providing a certain level of investment security um, over a certainty over term. And, um, and then effectively letting the market do its work. There are some very good examples of these, of precinct economics working in Europe. Um, the, the, the Rotterdam uh, hydrogen um, precinct is a, is a great example of a port 
um, very similar to the Port of Newcastle or the Port of Gladstone, uh, in using its, uh, its export facilities, its available land and its energy usage as a basis for um, effectively underwriting an investment in hydrogen. Um, that's the sort of thing that could happen in, um, in, in the precincts in Australia. Now, I've focused on Gladstone and, um, and the Hunter Valley, and in, in, partic in particular because they have smelters. Uh, Latrobe Valley and Portland is a slightly um, physically challenged um, precinct, but it has very similar um, um, potential. And then there are the, the non-aluminium uh, smel um, sectors, so Port Kembla, Wyala, um, the Quinana in Western Australia, which has a whole range of, um, of different types of heavy industry. All of these precincts benefit from demand collaboration and, and bringing that, that um, aggregated demand to market to encourage investment in renewable energy effective demand side management and then and then create the opportunities at the other end to use the the surplus electricity that's generated in that process um, to to drive other uh, energy prices down so for example hydrogen i might leave it at that point and um and go back to rebecca and then talk about uh, address any questions that we have if that's okay Thank you so much, Clark. That was um, fascinating. It, um, you raised many points that um, it would be good to talk through further. So we, we have one question and I would encourage all of the attendees to um, throw more questions um, into the Q&A. Um, the question relates to the role of super funds investing, which you did um, talk to. Um, uh, they've asked whether there's a role for super funds to invest, and I think you've already noted in your presentation that absolutely you see there is. Um, I'm sort of interested in your views on the risk profile of these in, um, as prospective investments relative to the sorts of investments that we typically see super funds making. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, super funds are really a, a very interesting uh, source of competitive advantage for Australia. The Deloitte has forecast that we'll have more than $8 trillion of, um, of industry super funding um, for investment by, by 2030. Um, and frankly, large scale investors, not just Australian super funds, but also um, sovereign wealth funds are starting to run out of things to invest in. They get to the point where they hit their maximum caps on equities around the world. Um, they've, they've started the, the infrastructure uh, sections of industry super funds have invested in Australia quite heavily in long-term assets um, from airports uh, to, to other forms of public transport, gas pipelines, um, and now they're moving into, into non-hard um, infrastructure assets, if you like, like land titles offices and, and other types of uh, long-term assets. But they all have similar characteristics and they are very large scale, um, very long term assets that that uh, often are closely correlated with with long term GDP growth, um, and they have a risk profile that investors can um, can model and really understand um, uh, clearly. So, my argument is that renewable energy has all of those characteristics, if it has the right. Um, aspects in place and as I said earlier um, scale has been a real problem um, but I think that um, with with demand collaboration um, scale can be can be addressed and and term has been an issue and, and that that's really a role for for government or or even um, uh, other generators uh, like clean co or AGL can stand if they're Anyone who's prepared to stand in and aggregate the term so that investors can make a 20 to 25 year commitment, I think that's gonna drive industry super. Um, the, the other aspect that's, that's worth noting is that the, these assets are, are very attractive infrastructure assets and can be leveraged quite significantly with debt, um, very low cost debt, particularly in, in this environment and what is likely to be a long-term low debt environment. <clears throat> that brings the cost of capital down. Um, the government has a role in that too. Um, CEFC and, and, and the state governments can provide um, their credit rating to, um, to, to underwrite debt 
um, which will again reduce the overall cost of capital and therefore reduce the electricity prices that can be offered. Thanks, Clark. Um, that's actually an, um, part of your response is an excellent segue into the next question. Um, for all those people who are now um, putting in their great questions into the Q&A, um, I'll invite you to um, ask them yourself um, and I'll unmute you to do that. Um, so um, if you're not comfortable to do that, please let me know, either in the chat or, or otherwise. But um, we might go to your question, Kedem, and I'll unmute, unmute you to um, allow you to ask that yourself. Hi, hello. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is around the role of, of uh, retailers or energy producers. You just mentioned on that in the last line or two, but I was wondering, a, what can they do? Can you know actively can they put a strategy to work with energy users? And kind of what will be their interest, kind of short term and long term? Like, does it play? Yeah, you know, is it just something that they would look at versus other generation, or does it have a benefit because you can lock in? energy users maybe for a long period of time, so maybe there's mutual benefit. So. Yeah, absolutely, they have a role to play. Um, I think the, you know, if you're a, a large scale, a, a Gen Taylor, an AGL or, or Origin or Energy Australia, and you have the option of uh, signing up your, your foundational load of customers before you have to make an investment, I think that's a very attractive way of doing things. Um, so I, th I think those, those players should be actively engaging with the users um, to create the sort of investment certainty they need. Um, they're, they're, they're transitioning from um, coal-fired and gas-fired power stations where operating costs and fuel costs are a significant part of the equation to uh, renewable energy infrastructure, which is largely about upfront cost. Um, the, the, the operating cost is, and the, the lack of fuel cost, obviously, um, changes the dynamics quite considerably. Um, I, I think in the Hunter Valley, AGL has made noises about uh, it tends to invest in, in a large-scale battery. Um, it, it, is, um, it is investing in, in renewable energy, but I think it could take a more holistic approach uh, and combine the different forms of generation you know, that they should be thinking about uh, about generation and firming uh, at the same time and then trying to balance that off against the load um, that uh, the, against the customer load. Thanks, Clark. Um, Alan, we might go to your question next. Alan Piers. I'm just, sorry, I should have pulled up your name so I could unmute you. Um, I'll meet you now. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, uh, hi, Clark. It's uh, very, very interesting. I've, I've been involved with, with BZD looking at beyond zero emissions, looking at the Hunter too. Um, uh, it was a bit of a techie question about um, we're seeing progress towards inert anodes uh, replacing the uh, the carbon anodes. And I was wondering, have you looked into the implications of that and, and in particular the extra electricity that might be needed to, uh, to replace the energy from using up the carbon anodes? Yeah, sure. Um, so Rio and Alcoa have actually formed a joint venture, um, Alesis in, in Canada, uh, to invest in inert anode technology. And Apple has in fact co-invested in that um, with, with the aim of creating what they call zero carbon aluminium. Um, I think that's slightly, uh, um, I was going to say deceitful, but it's not that. It's more of a marketing uh, statement there because alumina is also a key um, contributor to uh, emissions and, and you have to remove that as well. Uh, inert anodes are a great idea, but I think they're a little way from commercialisation. Um, we think that the existing smelters could add those to their technology roadmap, um, and 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 they would certainly be. Uh, they have a number of economic benefits as well as the obvious emission benefit. Um, if you take the, the it takes the um, additional input cost out of running a smelter, the the need for for carbon and pitch and and coal, um, but it will be quite a while before they become economically viable. As to the point about additional electricity, you know, I, I think of that as a, as, a, as a financial modelling question. That at a certain point, 
the the marginal cost of additional electricity to um, to drive inert anodes will be more than offset by the the economic value of providing lower carbon aluminium into the market uh, and and the fact that you've you've managed to avoid um, certain other operating expenses thanks clark um Grant, Cushion, you had a, um, a question around the definition and what we're talking about. I'll just invite you to speak. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, Clark, just in your discussion about the London Metal Exchange and the uh, green aluminium, is, is it just as simple as the percentage of renewables that it gets it or does that, is that have a threshold or how how do they contemplate sort of calculating what is green aluminium and what isn't? Is, is it a percentage sort of scale? Just wonder if you could elaborate. Yeah, sure. It's a um, it's an amount of, uh, of of carbon equivalent emissions per ton of aluminium, and it might be shocking for people who don't know about aluminium emissions to know that low carbon aluminium is four tons of, of carbon emissions per ton of aluminium. Uh, that's a definition that that the Aluminium Stewardship Initiative has adopted, uh, and and members sign up to that and then are are certified. It it's fair to say it's um, it's not uh, you know perfect, uh, and certainly there are some producers who can remain nameless for this seminar who who effectively um, pick and choose their electricity for aluminium um, so that they meet the low carbon threshold and then use uh, much higher emission um, electricity for for other parts of their business. Um, but yeah, it's a so it is that number um, you you can get to. Uh, because of the, the um, electricity intensity, you can basically get to low carbon aluminium with no changes to your process by simply um, putting enough renewable energy into, into the process. And it, it needs to be pretty close to 100% renewable in order to, to meet it. Um, the, the market is, is already uh, differentiating between that four um, ton per ton um, category and, and what Hydro and, uh, um, and Alcoa are selling, which is 2.5 tons per ton. Um, so that, that there's a, that there will be a pathway towards lower carbon, even lower carbon aluminium in the future. And, and back to Alan's question about inert anodes, you, you can take another ton and a half per ton of, of, um, Emissions out of the process by um, by changing that um, by changing from carbon to to inert anodes. Thanks, Clark. Um, we have another question which um, I will address to you. Um, it relates to the transmission infrastructure required to support these sorts of hubs and the extent to which there is a significant sort of new um, series of investment required. Uh, in that infrastructure um, with the um, associated roles for um, state and federal government and um, planning the electricity market um, um, operator and um, transmission providers uh, or whether the hubs you're talking about have the requisite infrastructure. Yeah, uh, look, re renewables and transmission problems are um, are closely related. Uh, so it's a it's a very good question. The, one of the reasons that we focused on the Hunter Valley and Gladstone is they actually have excellent existing transmission capability. Um, the Hunter Valley has uh, the the lines from um, from Bayswater and Liddell to uh, to Tomago. Uh, and then also uh, significant transmission into Curry Curry, uh, where, where there was an aluminium smelter until a few years ago. So th there's a lot to work with. Um, the New South Wales government has announced renewable energy zones and has um, indicated as part of the integrated system plan that it's going to invest in transmission to support those zones. Um, but I actually think there's a really good argument for for siting uh, renewable energy uh, generation assets in the Hunter Valley to take advantage of that existing transmission. Because um, you're absolutely right, it's a key factor. In Portland, for example, there's pretty good transmission from certain parts of, of Western Victoria straight to Portland um, that would support enough uh, renewable generation to run Portland. And Gladstone is in a really interesting position 
in that it, it effectively has a behind the meter solution at the moment. The Gladstone power station and the um, and Boyne smelter is connected on, on a grid. And if that grid could be extended to the Fitzroy um, renewable energy zone, uh, there's more than enough room for um, for the for the two two gigawatts or, or more of power that's needed um, to support Boyne. So very much a, a key part of the consideration. But I think those um, and I, I I know I take your point that you know it would be a lot easier if there was a clear federal government energy policy that supported this direction. But I think the state governments have done a lot to address those problems, and and there is enough momentum um, that in the sort of time frames we're talking about for these projects, uh, th those problems can be solved. And I think that is an important thing to note. You know, I, I'm not saying that we can switch to renewable energy next year. Um, the, the, these are very large demands that that we're talking about, and it takes four years to build that sort of um, generation so we actually have the time to to think through the issues and and given the, the massive scale we can also directly address um, the transmission issues because if you need to spend um, an extra hundred million dollars on, on transmission that's much easier to justify in the context of a five billion dollar um, generation investment Um, we'll now go to Jochen Zeal. Um, Jochen, I'll invite you to unmute and um, ask your question. Oh, hello. Um, this is this is basically a follow-up question to to um, the one just uh, you you just answered. Um, I have the feeling that you uh, minimise the need for government role in in this transition um a, a bit um, as a as a typical australian frustration and so my question is uh, do the international examples like the one you sh uh, you talked about in rotterdam um, show a more constructive role central government policy can settings can play in this transition <laughs> Uh, that could be a rhetorical question. Um, yes, of course, uh, the, there's there's a clear correlation between the countries that do renewable uh, or do precinct economics well and 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 positive government involvement. Um, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands um, have all been um, active. The governments have been active supporters of precincts. Um, but the but but the private sector has come to the party as well. Um, I guess my attitude about government involvement is I, I'm trying to work with what we have uh, and, and make as much progress as we can. Uh, I'm not for uh, complaining about the existing political situation, but rather to try and create momentum mm -hmm. to, um, to 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 make progress. And I think the U.S. is another great example of what you can do. Um, you know, or not only do they have a federal government that doesn't have a, um, a constructive energy policy, they have an actively um, um, negative federal um, government, and yet the, the some of the best uh, renewable resources in the world are in Texas. Are, um, are growing, you know, the, there's a billion dollar batteries being um, implemented in Florida. Um, the, the, there is a huge amount of um, of activity in countries without strong government support. But then you look at countries like India, where um, that they basically underwrite the um, PPAs, like I was mentioning with the long-term um, off-take agreements that that create the investment needed for, um, for renewables. And as a result, renewables are just flooding, investment is flooding into India, even though if you look at the economics of investing in, in renewables in India, you do it in Australia every day of the week from a um, political interconnect um, project risk perspective, um, but they're getting um, 12, 13, 14% um, cost of equity, uh, re equity returns um, underwritten every day of the week. All right, that's fascinating. Um, thank you so much, Clark. 
So um, I have an, another question, and um, which I'll put myself as the um, moderator prerogative. So, I, um, one of the points you noted uh, earlier in your presentation was that these, that aluminium and some of the other um, uh, commodities that you're talking about, ammonia, are, are very much part of an international commodity market, where the um, supply and demand, demand conditions are going to be determined in those global markets. I'm interesting, interested in your views on just the um, how those will evolve um, as we uh, and, and Australia's opportunity in those evolving markets, um, so that as we transition to a zero emissions future, but also in the short term, um, whilst that transition is emerging. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I've spent more time on on aluminium than the others. Um, but as I was saying in the presentation, I think the, the long-term prospects for aluminium are, are strong. Um, the transportation sector is, is very much focused on light weighting, um, both because, um, because light weight means more efficient um, vehicles uh, from a fuel consumption point of view, but probably more dramatically, the increase of electric vehicles is, um, is driving more aluminium in content um, to counteract the weight of the batteries. So the, the, the long-term demand um, cycle is, is attractive for aluminium. Um, if Australia can participate in the low carbon component of that, that market, then I think it would be subject to less volatility and, and benefit from that, that stronger demand. Um, and it will be a really good place to invest. Um, ammonia is, um, is a different uh, story. It's a very large scale activity and Australia typically makes ammonia to make ammonium nitrate. So Orica is one of the world's leading explosives companies um, uh, and it's also uh, made for fertilizers. Um, if we can get the hydrogen industry going, then we can be a, a world leader in, in, um, in hydrogen and also in ammonia. And ammonia could well be um, one of the preferred forms of transportation of hydrogen as a fuel. Um, and, and there's also um, talk in, uh, of innovating diesel engines to run on ammonia. Um, so I think it's, a, it, it's an industry that has a, a really um, strong future. Whether we're able to get to the scale to participate in that is a, is a question that I don't have an answer to at the moment. Mm, interesting. Um, I have another question from, um, from two participants that, that I'll put to you. Um, one is regarding the role of state government um, and whether you foresee a state government being the coordinator that might drive this sort of um, hub project. Um, cool. uh, yeah, I think the state state governments have a, a key role to play. And I think they, they've started well setting up renew, renewable energy zones. Um, that, as I said, I think they have a role in providing debt um, to, to support um, renewable energy investment, and they have a role providing some underwriting on the on the on the period of um, of, of power purchase agreements to to support that investment as well. Um, the, you know, we're talking about precincts with a number of industries. In some cases, like the Hunter Valley, you've got a number of councils. Um, you've got uh, organisations that don't necessarily naturally coordinate with each other. So someone needs to step into the middle and, and drive that. Um, and, and I think the state government has a role in it. Um, otherwise, it's left to uh, enthusiastic uh, individuals. <laughs> I'll put my hand up for that. Right. Um, uh, there's, there's another question that relates um, to the, uh, the time, I suppose the short term, and um, this relationship between the smelters and their current financial position and the possibility that um, is widely discussed in the media of some shutting down, um, as well as the, um, the commentary around the length of time required for transmission problems or issues to be resolved, uh, and just how those two may come, those, those timing issues um, might unfold. Um, how do we make sure we don't lose this, the current um, capacity and workforce and um, uh, and deal with just that, I suppose, the next five to 10 years? Yeah, well, it, it, it's, we are talking about a long-term project, but the decisions 
that we make now will affect um, what happens over the over the next four years, the next ten years. I think the it takes a long time to shut down a plant as well. I mean, it, it took a long time for the the auto industry in Australia to to gradually grind down. Um, I think there's there's an opportunity for um, for the existing smelters to continue for the next four years or so. And if you look at them one by one, um, Portland is in the process of of sorting out what's likely to be a, a short to medium term energy solution. Uh, Tomago has got a contract in place for the next few years. Um, and whilst they complain a lot about energy prices, they're still making money at Tomago. Um, Boyne probably needs to solve its problems in the next couple of years because it it's, um, has an unhedged exposure to the, to the spot markets. So I, I think but they're also, they're big companies um, and, and they have significant um, remediation obligations at the other side of, of running these businesses. So I think that they can be encouraged to stay in the market for the sort of time that we need to, to, to map out the answer, which, as I said, is a sort of four year, five year time frame. Um, another um, another question that's been raised relates to the um, the issues that may arise from our existing legislative and standards legislative frameworks and, and standards. Um, now the the person who asked this question um, referred to last Sunday night's Q and A, which I have to admit I didn't see, um, but. Um, uh, I'm interested in your views on the applicability or barriers created by the current legislative framework. Yes, sure. I did watch last Monday's Q and A. Um, they were talking a lot about legislation in relation to offshore wind, um, for and that certainly is a problem that ought to be solved. the 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 major issue that I see in in relation to, to legislation or the regulatory environment in general, it is the price signal for demand side response. That it, if we want the, these large loads in the grid to provide stability and to, um, and to counteract intermittency, then we need to provide a clear um, price signal that, that encourages the owners to invest um, to provide that service. Um, and it, it can be a little bit cute in that um, Tomago, for example, gets a flat electricity price. It's got certain demand side response obligations built into it. And, um, and, and so then they say, well, we don't, we don't have a price signal, so we're not um, motivated to invest. Well, they, they did get a price signal back uh, a few years ago. Um, and, and so that, that's a, a commercial challenge. But I think if we were a little more, if the if the AEMO and the and AER um, were a little more attuned to the the um, the economics that that these large demands um, require in order to make the investments that will result in grid stability, that then we could we could have that conversation. Um, and you know, there are some really good examples of large-scale smelter modulation around the world. Um, TreeMet in Germany uses the energy of Podior um, technology and actually makes more money selling energy services in the market than they do selling aluminium. Um, Hydro Norsk uh, also uses their significant hit, um, hydro um, generation assets to, to create um, energy services revenue as one of their main lines of, of, um, of growth in, in their business. So there's definitely a, uh, uh, examples of how flexible manufacturing can both help grid stability, but also generate profits for, for the, the companies. Thanks, Carl. Uh, so we have probably time for one more question, I think, and um, there is one more question that's been um, raised in the Q&A. And it relates to the uh, the economic and equipment life of the current smelters in Australia. Um, so these are already 20 to 30 years old, and um, you could say nearing the end of their economic and equipment life. Uh, so I suppose the question relates to the relevance of that to a, um, 
to either replacement of the ageing equipment or um, uh, ensuring that they they could be productive and efficient in the uh, in the sort of future timeframes that we we're discussing. Yeah, um, actually, smelters are very long life assets. Um, so there's there's nothing wrong with a fifty year old smelter uh, if it's been maintained um, effectively. And my understanding of and you know, have really focused on the three mainland smelters. So um, I'm, I'm not going to comment on Bell Bay or, or the New Zealand smelter, but th they have kept their, their technology relatively up to date. Um, yes, it does need to be invested in over time. Um, but one of the huge uh, investments uh, required in, in any heavy industry, and smelting's no different, is actually just setting up the foundation um, to, to provide, to conduct the smelting. The, the pot line technology is um, is evolved over time and replaced over time, uh, and and so having made that massive investment, uh, I think it's a um, there's a strong case for the the continued evolution of the technology. Um, I, I don't think they're they're near the end of their life at the moment. Thank you so much, Clark. That, that pretty much brings us to the end of the time we have available. Um, and it's been absolutely fascinating. I've learned a great deal. Um, so, and uh, we're really um, very appreciative of you coming and giving this seminar. It's a, a very good way to end the series we've been running that the VCTF is sponsored on industrial demand response. Um, I would, um, so I'd like to uh, suppose bring the seminar to a close by um, thanking you and everybody who's participated. Uh, and also encouraging others and everyone to look at the upcoming webinars that we will be continuing to hold in the coming weeks um, and that will be on the Climate and Energy College and the Energy Transition Hub website. Um, but thank you again. And, um, Thanks, Rebecca.